quality is generalized to quantum field theory in any straightforward way. Um, so taking that route sort of has the potential to just end up wasting a lot of time on solutions that can't possibly work in the long run. Um, so what I want to do in this talk is first think about do any of our, our existing solutions to the measurement problem actually work in GFT? Um, and second, think about what a, what a solution that does work would look like uh, in the general terms. Uh, so I'll begin by saying what I personally mean by the measurement problem. Uh, I'll then distinguish between two important classes of approaches to the measurement problem. Uh, I'll argue that uh, unitary only approaches um, have, have an advantage in that they work better for QFT, um, but the single world realist approaches uh, have an advantage for sort of epistemic reasons. Um, so we have a good reason to want to try to make a single world realist approach work in QFT, but it just turns out to, to be very difficult to do so. Uh, so I'll then uh, investigate three different routes we might take to try to make a single world realist approach work in QFT, um, and in each case I'll give an example of an existing approach that seems to be that kind of route. Um, I, I emphasize that these are just examples. I'm not trying to give an exhaustive list of possibilities. I'm sure there are other possibilities, and indeed, if people here have ideas for other possibilities, I'd love to hear them. So, um, what is the measurement problem? Well, everybody who writes about the measurement problem seems to have a slightly different idea of what exactly the problem is. Um, often, it's described in somewhat ontological terms, uh, but I prefer to think of it in a more sort of epistemic way. And the thought being that when we do science, we start off by assuming that our measurements or observations are giving us reliable information about reality, uh, and we thereby arrive at a theory of reality, and uh, that theory is going to tell us something about the physical nature of our measurements, uh, and you know, the hope or expectation is that what the theory tells us is that the measurements are indeed reliable ways of getting information about reality, and so that we kind of justify our original starting point. So that all seems to work in a fairly trivial way in <coughs> classical physics, but in quantum mechanics, something seems to go wrong. Um, so if you look at purely unitary quantum mechanics, um, and it's well known, uh, caps and boxes appear not to have definite states. But perhaps more problematically, it seems as though measurements don't have definite outcomes, or perhaps they have too many definite outcomes. Uh, either way, uh, something a bit strange is happening to the epistemology, uh, and it's certainly going to at least take some work to figure out how to uh, make sense of the, the, nature, the, the way in which we get information about what the world via those kinds of um, the alternative is to uh, take a view like of, with, of quantum mechanics with collapse and saying that uh, collapses occur whenever someone performs a measurement. In that case, we do have unique well-defined outcomes, but it comes at the cost of uh, being able to say roughly nothing at all about the physical nature of measurements because that approach just takes measurement as an unanalyzed primitive. So that approach still doesn't really reassure us that measurements are the, are the right kind of thing physically to give us reliable information about the world. Um, so the, the formulation of the measurement I'll be concerned with, therefore, is the problem of how to give a description of physical reality, which both reproduces the, uh, it's the results of quantum mechanics, and which also tells a reasonably sensible story about measurement and the epistemology of science. Uh, so I'll distinguish a couple of different classes of, of interpretations or approaches to the measurement problem. Uh, so the first is what you might call unitary-only approaches. Uh, those are the, the approaches which use only the standard unitary formalism of quantum mechanics uh, and don't add heavy variables or wave function collapses or anything of that kind. So that includes obviously the Everett interpretation uh, and then also various things like uh, some formulations of the Copenhagen interpretation, some neo Copenhagen interpretation, maybe cubism, um, some pragmatic interpretations, and older formulations of relational quantum mechanics. Uh, so the advantage of the unitary only interpretation is that because they don't add anything to unitary quantum mechanics, they can be applied in a straightforward way, pretty much just out of the box, to basically anything that we might apply uh, unitary quantum mechanics to. So in particular, it seems fairly straightforward to get a unitary only interpretation to work in the context of quantum field theory. Um, a second class of interpretations is what I call the single world realist interpretations. These are, roughly speaking, the ones in which there exists uh, a unique uh, observer independent reality, which is shared by all observers and which all observers have access to. Um, obviously, we don't expect all observers to have the same information all the time, but we do expect in this kind of picture that any pair of initially co-located observers um, can use reliable mechanisms which ensure that they and or all of their successors will eventually agree on the content of observable reality uh, and a particular measurement outcome. So well-known examples of single-world realist approaches include the Sigurd-Bohm approach um, and the spontaneous now, single-world realist approaches have an advantage with respect to the sort of 
the systemic problem I set out on the previous slide, uh, because in a single world realist approach, uh, there's a very simple story we can tell about what's going on in the measurement. The measurement just involves getting some information about this, this single world that is shared by all observers, uh, and so uh, the epistemology seems fairly, fairly simple and not all that different to classical physics. Um, Non-single world approach, realist approaches, on the other hand, more or less um, invariably seem to involve some kind of epistemic weirdness. We have non-unique outcomes, or we have observers uh, who are unable to communicate with each other, or there's some kind of problem which is going to get in the way of telling the story we'd like to tell about the epistemology of quantum mechanics. So you, you may or may not think that those problems can be overcome, um, but nonetheless, there's certainly at least a prima facie reason to be interested in having a non-single, a single world realist approach and wanting to get, be able to make that work in general. So evidently then, kind of the dream here would be to find an approach which is both unitarianly and also single world realist. Uh, that would make our lives much easier. But unfortunately, I don't know of any existing uh, approach which I personally would consider both unitarianly and single world realist. Um, and I'm somewhat skeptical that such a thing can be done. Um, basically, that just kind of follows from the structure of unitary quantum mechanics. Unitary quantum mechanics doesn't provide a mechanism for singling out uh, unique measurement outcomes, and therefore it certainly doesn't say anything about the relation between unique outcomes obtained by different observers. So it seems as though any unitary only <coughs> will either fail to have unique outcomes or will have observers who have unique outcomes that aren't related to each other in any systematic way. So either way, we end up with a situation where there is, is no unique world shared by all observers. Um, so it seems likely to me that we are going to have to choose between unitary only and single world realist approaches. Um, and so both have advantages and disadvantages. Uh, and so the question is, can we make which ones can we make work throughout the whole of quantum mechanics and QFT? Um, so when it comes to QFT, I, I think it should be uncontroversial that a viable solution to the measurement problem must ultimately work for quantum field theory as well. Uh, you know, the evidence for quantum field theory is part of our empirical evidence for quantum mechanics. Uh, quantum field theory has been confirmed to a very high degree of accuracy. Uh, and quantum field theory and quantum mechanics are, roughly speaking, continuous with each other. So it doesn't make a lot of sense to imagine that there would be two completely different solutions to the measurement problem in, in each case. So we should consider to what degree the existing interpretations can, in fact, be generalized to quantum field theory. So as I said, the unitary only approaches seem to work in a fairly straightforward way. Uh, but the single world realist approaches have a lot more trouble. Um, roughly speaking, I think that's because uh, the histories encoded in the unitary evolution of the quantum state are somewhat approximate and emergent. Um, and if you want a single world realist approach and you want to sort of select and actualize just one of those histories, then it seems natural to think that you know, the boundaries of the single world real world have got to be precisely defined and they can't be approximate or vague. Um, so you're going to have to do something to uh, <coughs> obtain precisely defined histories out of this sort of space of uh, vaguely defined histories. Uh, so in general, single world realist by adding to the formalism uh, something precisely defined on which their um, unique real world can supervene. Uh, so in Wallace's words, they seem to want uh, a microphysically stateable, precisely defined dynamical variable, which on coarse graining and restriction to the non-relativistic particle mechanics regime, nonetheless delivers coarse grain particle position or some appropriate surrogate. That is to say, we want some kind of variable which is uh, sufficiently fundamental, which means presumably that it is uh, microphysically stateable and precise, uh, which gives rise to the appropriate classical uh, variables in the right limit. So in uh, the Broy bohm the Broy bohm theory, for example, that variable would be the position of the particles, or whatever the generalization of that would be. Um, and the collapse approaches, that variable is the basis in which the collapse would take place, uh, and so on. So the problem then is that it seems quite hard to achieve to find a variable like this within QFT. Um, and Wallace argues, I think, uh, quite compellingly, in my opinion, that it's quite unlikely that we will find such a thing within QFT. Um, basically, the problem is that uh, QFT, the QFT, QFT regime looks very unlike the classical regime, and the connection between them is very complicated and indirect. Um, so it seems quite unlikely that you can find, sort of inside of QFT, some relatively straightforwardly defined variable, uh, such that when you put, put it through all the various transformations you need to do to get to the macroscopic regime, it still ends up looking like a relatively simply defined uh, position variable or something of that kind. Um, it, it could be the case, it could be that, that you know, we just haven't succeeded in finding that yet, but um, I personally am not that optimistic about the prospects of finding such a thing. Uh, so there have been some attempts to, to 
generalize things like ad roibom and spontaneous collapse to QFT. Uh, so for example, in Dubois Bohm, there have been suggestions that we can replace particle position with uh, particle position and number of particles, or electromagnetic fields, or fermionic fields. Uh, but the problem is that uh, all of those things are somewhat uh, emergent and approximate within QFT, um, and so they don't look suitable to be you know, the fundamental microphysical variable on which all of reality supervenes. It seems like you need to find something to find at the very smallest of scales on which your single world, real world could supervene, and it's very unclear how to do that. Um, so one response that uh, people who like single world realist approaches have sometimes made to this, this situation is to say that, well, we know that QFT is just an effective theory. It emerges out of something else. And you know, hopefully, when we discover what it emerges out of, uh, the appropriate microphysical variable will just become evident at that point. So we should just wait until that happens. Um, and you know, maybe that will, that will indeed happen. But again, I'm somewhat skeptical, because if QFT emerges out of something else, it probably is going to emerge out of something that is even less classical than QFT itself. It would be pretty weird if QFT emerged out of a sort of quasi-classical description, and then we had this intermediate, very weird description, and then that turned back into a classical description at high level. Um, so I wouldn't expect that whatever it emerges from to be more classical. And if it is less classical, then the problem just gets worse, right? It's going to be even harder to find a suitable microphysical precise and defined dynamical variable, which will give rise to the right uh, right kind of variable on the classical limit. Um, so I don't know if just waiting to be saved by a successive theory is uh, particularly a helpful approach in this case. So uh, what can we do? Um, so that leaves us in a somewhat interesting situation. Uh, so if you buy the argument that, uh, that the uh, non-single world realist approaches uh, probably don't work for epistemic reasons, um, and if you also buy the argument that uh, the existing single world realist approaches don't work because we can't find the right kind of variables within QFT, uh, you are uh, left with the conclusion that you know, maybe, even after 100 years of thinking about it, we don't have even one viable interpretation of a paper to the quantum mechanics or solution to the measurement problem. Um, so that seems somewhat alarming. Um, of course, you could deny either of those claims. You might think the variables will, will, will one day be found, or you might think the epistemic issues can be solved in the non-single world realist approaches. Uh, but even if you do, it is at least, I think, interesting to consider what might be left uh, in the remaining space of solutions if we rule out all of those possibilities. Um, so I think there are, in fact, a number of ways we might uh, successfully arrive at something that works despite those difficulties. So in particular, let's look back at uh, these sort of special variables on which the single world realist wants the uh, unique real world to define, to supervene. Um, we specified a number of properties that we expect that variable to have in the previous slide. Um, so the natural question is to ask, can we perhaps relax one of those properties uh, and still get something that looks like a sensible single world realist view out? So first, uh, empirically adequate. Uh, that's the idea that the variables should, uh, under appropriate course of graining, give rise to the right kind of position variables to define our macroscopic experience. That, I think, seems sort of indispensable. We haven't succeeded in solving the measurement problem if we can't ultimately reproduce the usual predictions of quantum mechanics in the right limit. Um, but the other three properties, I think, all look like they might, might potentially be up for debate. Uh, so microphysically statable uh, and dynamical, uh, those are very intuitive and natural things to expect for a fundamental variable on which reality uh, supervenes. Uh, they are consistent with the way that we usually think about physics. But, you know, quantum mechanics has forced us to change some of the ways we think about physics, so I think we should at least be open to the possibility that, in fact, reality might supervene on variables which are not microphysically or not dynamical. Um, precisely defined looks a bit more complicated. Um, if the reasons why you want to have a single world realist approach are uh, primarily because you have a deep metaphysical commitment to the existence of a single real world, uh, then I think it would, would kind of make sense to say, well, I think the single real world must have precise boundaries, uh, and so I can't accept that it would supervene on variables which are not precisely defined. Um, but recall that I personally am looking for single world realist approaches for epistemic reasons. Um, and we can perhaps have a bit more flexibility in that case. Uh, after all, observers like people and cats are not precisely defined. Uh, their observations are not precisely defined. Uh, and so uh, it seems reasonable to think that the single real world which they share might also not be precisely defined in some way. Uh, so if that is the reason you're interested in a single world realist approach, it's possible that you can arrive at something which works, even if your single real world uh, doesn't supervene on precisely defined variables it might still be adequate to address the kind of epistemic issues I've been discussing. Uh, so 
the remainder of this talk, I'm going to discuss each of those three possibilities in turn and think a little bit about what they might look like and give an example of, of an existing approach that is going in that direction. So first off, uh, the emergence approach, i.e. the idea that reality could supervene on variables that are not precisely defined. Um, so there's a number of different ways one might go, in, go about do, doing that, corresponding to different meanings of the word vagueness. Um, first off, you could, you could try some kind of epistemic vagueness. Uh, I don't know if that's going to help very much, though, because even if you know, there's, there's some epistemic vagueness about the real world in the sense that we ourselves don't know the exact boundaries of the unique real world, uh, nonetheless, one might think that at an ontological level, the unique real world should still be well-defined, uh, and so it would still have to be on precisely defined variables, so you would kind of not have made much progress there. Um, ontic vagueness seems more helpful, so, so vagueness about what exists or what there is. Um, one could sort of imagine a picture in which which we select one of these sort of Everettian histories and we actualize that history. Um, and because the histories aren't precisely defined, uh, what we actualize won't be precisely defined either. There'll be sort of fuzzy boundaries at the edges where it's uh, not entirely clear whether things are real or not real. Uh, but perhaps if you're willing to accept ontic vagueness, you might be willing to accept that kind of possibility. Um, there's an interesting uh, recent work by Eddie Chin on fundamental gnomic vagueness, and I can see an, an interesting route to potentially uh, making this kind of work within the framework that Eddie sets up. Um, but here I'm going to focus on another possibility, uh, an, ex an existing interpretation of quantum mechanics, which I think does already implement semantic vagueness, that is to say, vagueness about what words mean or refer to. Um, so that approach is uh, relational quantum mechanics. Um, relational quantum mechanics was originally postulated by Carlo Rovelli. Uh, so the idea here is that the values of variables, uh, the variables don't have values in and of themselves intrinsically. Uh, rather, variables have values relative to uh, observers or systems or uh, uh, perspectives. Uh, so, for example, in a scenario in which Alice performs a measurement on some system S and obtains a definite result for the value of some variable O, um, in that case, that variable has a definite value relative to Alice. Uh, but if we have some other observer, Bob, Bob will, uh, looking from the outside, will describe that whole interaction unitarily. He will just see Alice and the system S as becoming entangled uh, and being in a uh, different states at different values of O. So relative to Bob, the variable O does not have a definite, definite value. Um, and kind of the key claim of relational quantum mechanics is that both of them are right. It's not the case that Bob is just missing some information. Uh, in fact, relative to Bob, it really is true that there is no definite value for this variable. So the original version of relational quantum mechanics uh, is a unitary only interpretation. Um, and therefore, as we might expect, it is not a single world realist approach. Uh, that's because in this picture, each observer has their own set of relative facts, um, and because unitary quantum mechanics doesn't provide us with any mechanism to connect up the relative facts for, for different observers, uh, it's necessarily the case that each observer is kind of trapped within their own world of relative facts, and able to learn anything about what's going on in anybody else's uh, set of relative facts. So uh, Carlo and I recently suggested adding something to relational quantum mechanics to address this problem. Uh, so our postulate is called cross-perspective links, um, and it's, it's fairly straightforward. It just says that in the case that I just described, uh, if Bob then goes on to perform a measurement on Ellis in a basis which is appropriate to getting information about her measurement outcome, uh, for example, he could just ask her what her measurement outcome was. Uh, under those specific circumstances, uh, if Ellis hasn't gone any interactions which have destroyed that information, uh, then uh, Bob's measurement result in that case will match Ellis's measurement result in that case, and therefore their perspectives will become aligned in a certain way, and they're starting to share, share some kind of uh, some kind of well-defined reality. Uh, so in, in that picture, once we add cross-perspective links, um, imagine a community of observers going, undergoing constant interactions, uh, and in the process of, that interaction, of those interactions, they will come to, sh to share a, a well-defined uh, unique reality uh, based on the information that is passed on and shared between them in those interactions. So we have a sort of interesting, slightly participatory picture where there is a unique real world, but it is sort of brought into being by the interactions between agents rather than being a pre-existing uh, stage on which they live. Um, so we can see that this does indeed uh, implement semantic vagueness because the referent of the term the unique real world is somewhat vaguely defined here. There's going to be some sort of key core information short shared by pretty much all of the observers in the community, um, but there, as, uh, there will also be potentially some pieces of information, fuzzy edges, which are of which only a few observers have access to, so there's not necessarily any well-defined boundary between the, the, work, the unique real world shared by these observers and the rest of, of reality. Um, in addition, one can imagine that in principle there could be a totally different community of observers somewhere else, uh, and those observers, if they 
they haven't um, interacted in any way with the uh, first community will end up having their own set of relative facts which could be completely different from the set shared by the original observers. Um, so in some sense this is a, quite a single world realist approach because we could have you know, several different worlds associated with different communities. Um, but nonetheless I think it is single world realist enough to solve the kind of epistemic problems one might have worried about because it does mean that at least the community of human observers who have together arrived at an empirically confirmed quantum mechanics are correct in their belief that they all share the same reality and are meaningfully sharing information about measurement of them. Um, so I think it's reasonable to hope that something like this would work in the context of quantum field theory. That's because we essentially took a unitary only, only approach here and added something relatively minimal to it, and in particular what's been added is kind of irrelevant to unitary quantum mechanics itself precisely because unitary quantum mechanics doesn't say anything about the relationships between the unique outcomes obtained by different so in principle, this kind of approach should be translatable to uh, quantum field theory. Um, that said, there are a couple of issues that I would probably want to see addressed. Um, one is that this way of uh, creating connections between, between perspectives um, has the consequence that we end up with quite a lot of redundant structure. Uh, so in rela relation with quantum mechanics, uh, any system whatsoever, even just a, a, a fundamental particle, like an electron, uh, can be an observer, or, and that means that uh, even in an inter interaction between you know, two electrons, for example, there has to be some cross-perspective links formed. Uh, furthermore, it seems likely that for interactions between fundamental particles, you're going to have to apply the cross-perspective postulate not just in one basis, but in a whole bunch of different bases. So you're get, going to end up with this very complex structure of uh, cross-perspective connections between all the different microscopic particles in the world. Um, and that seems potentially a bit like overkill, because the point of introducing cross-perspective links was just to have connections between perspectives of conscious observers like us. We don't, it seems like we shouldn't need all this, this structure at the, the microscopic level. Uh, so in principle, it might be nice to have the cross-perspective links emerge in some kind of limit in the process of decoherence, maybe. Um, but I don't yet know how to do that, because uh, the way the postulate is defined seems to need fairly, fairly well, everything to be fairly well defined and precise. Uh, so it, it's not clear how to do that in a proper way. Uh, relatedly, uh, one might worry that when we move to QFT, there's going to be a problem applying relational quantum mechanics because uh, the, the usual formulation of the approach leans very heavily on the existence of well-defined systems. We need well-defined systems because our variables have got to be relativized to something, and so we need those systems. Uh, otherwise, we don't have any meaningful variables at all. Um, one might worry about that because uh, in QFT, things like particles are only approximate and emergent, so we're not going to have any sort of precisely defined systems. We're only going to have somewhat approximately defined systems. Um, and it's a little bit unclear clear that we can apply either the standard formulation of, of, of relational quantum mechanics or the cross-perspective mix postulate if we don't have well-defined systems. Um, one way to address that might be to move to a picture where instead of relativizing things to systems, we relativize things to uh, regions of space-time instead, so that variables would then be relative to parts of space-time rather than specific, specific uh, particles. Um, alternatively, one could have a picture in which uh, in which, which uh, systems are, are allowed to emerge from appropriate limits as well. Um, but again, that would face the same problem, that it, it seems as though the way Archimedes formulates requires the system to be precisely defined and requires the cross-perspective links uh, to, to work between what precisely defined systems. So maybe there's what, some way to make that all work in an emergent limit, but again, I don't know how to do that right now. Okay, so the next uh, possibility uh, I suggested is investigating uh, involved a picture in which uh, the real world supervenes on variables which are not microscopically defined. Um, so this might seem somewhat counterintuitive. Uh, in particular, if you're not going down the vagueness route, then the variables need to be precisely defined, and you know, it seems natural to think that the only var variables which are really precisely defined are the ones at the very bottom, the smallest of scales, uh, and therefore um, everything else at, high, at somewhat higher scales is only emergent, and so you can't get precisely defined variables uh, if you don't have them um, but at the same time, I think there are signs that QFT would potentially be quite friendly to a non-reductionist approach. Um, of course, it exhibits quite good separation of scales with autonomy at different scales. That potentially gives us space to uh, define some variables at a higher, at a higher scale, uh, which are really autonomous and don't need to supervene on anything underneath at all. Uh, we also have uh, cases where many different where underlying theories are taken to the same fixed points by the normalization group, group, group flow. So those theories will give rise to the same uh, Higher, higher scale or lower energy phenomenology, and that potentially gives us some space to be a bit less literal about how we think about the underlying theories uh, and to take the, the, the higher distance or lower energy theory more seriously as what, what is potentially fundamental in some sense. So I think there's, there's at least
least reasons to think that something like this might work in the context of QFT. Um, in addition, we know that QFT is extremely detailed and accurate in uh, the microscopic world, so it seems very unlikely that we can change much in the microscopic setting without totally breaking the whole theory. Uh, but at the same time, obviously, quantum mechanics, uh, there are many uh, microscopic features in the world that are not yet well explained by unitary quantum mechanics, things like uh, temporal asymmetry, uh, gravity, perhaps dark energy and dark matter. So there's a, there's a lot more scope there to add things at a higher level um, and without just necessarily destroying all the predictions of uh, quantum mechanics in the regimes in which it's most successful. So what would, a, uh, what would an approach with reality supervening on non-microscopic variables look like? Uh, well, one approach which is going in this kind of direction is the consistent histories formalism. So in this formalism, uh, it's, it's usually defined in non-relativistic quantum mechanics. Um, we, we describe a history as a sequence of orthogonal emission predictors associated with times. Uh, the idea is that predictors essentially represent something like events, and so a history is a sequence of events telling a story of you know, how the history of the world goes. Um, so given an initial state of the Hamiltonian, we can form various different sets of consistent histories, i.e. sets of histories uh, where the members of the set are all mutually orthogonal, and therefore we can assign uh, sensible practical probability distributions over those sets. So the consistent histories approach uh, isn't necessarily intended as a solution to the measurement problem, um, and even if it is uh, understood as a solution to the measurement problem, um, it doesn't necessarily look like a single world realist approach because we have all of these different consistent sets, and within each consistent set we have a whole bunch of different histories, so that looks like a sort of many worlds type effect here. Um, but you can sort of imagine what it might look like to try to define a single world realist version. Essentially what, what that would require would be um, to start by, by setting out some way of choosing one particular consistent set from all of the sets that can be defined, uh, and then you could just probabilistically, probabilistically select and actualize one of the histories, and that history would be your single real world. So um, as Sorkin, Sorkin points out, this approach has the interesting feature that it sort of tends to deny the existence of the micro world. It withholds meaning from any statement referring to individual atoms or other forms of microscopic matter. Um, that's because uh, the events featuring in a consistent history will in general be somewhat micro macroscopic events. Uh, they have to be because they have to be uh, orthogonal, uh, and typically we need, need the coherence to make, uh, make events be become sufficiently orthogonal, uh, and so we end up with most, most reasonable accepted consistent histories being composed largely of macroscopic events. So if we take it that reality supervenes directly on the history, it follows that indeed it is supervening on variables which are in some sense precisely defined but not defined at a microscopic level, there's sort of just nothing going on at a microscopic level in this kind of setting. So that, that um, gives some reason to think that this kind of approach could potentially work in QFT. Then we don't have to be too worried about the details of, that, that of what is happening at, at very small scales because uh, those details just end up going into the mathematics of how the consistent bit is selected, but we don't have to sort of find any meaningful ontology at those very small scales. Um, and indeed, although this, this approach is largely formulated in non-relativistic quantum mechanics, there have been some suggestions for routes to take to uh, generalize it to quantum field theory, and because it's a very general formalism that can be sort of applied basically to anything that we describe in quantum mechanical terms, it, it seems reasonable to think that this would, would potentially work at some point in QFT. That said, there are also a couple of problems for the consistent history approach to deal with. Um, one is that uh, in this picture, it doesn't seem like we, we necessarily get a, a stable macroscopic reality out. Um, a history which, which is quasi-classical up to a certain, certain time can sort of suddenly cease to be quasi-classical in the future. Um, and perhaps even more problematically, uh, that the past is not necessarily stable. Um, so adding uh, an event to a history can cause two histories which, uh, which previously uh, were perfectly decoherent to no longer be decoherent. So we can have situations where records of the past become unstable. Um, and can be destroyed or changed by uh, interactions in the future. Um, that seems not ideal for the epistemology of science because obviously when we do science we need to look at records and assume that, you know, at least roughly speaking, the records are giving us meaningful information about what really happened in the past. Um, so the danger here is that although this is technically a single world realist approach, it ends up running into epistemic issues which, which look just as bad as or potentially worse than uh, the ones we saw in the non-single Um, so that, that's, that is definitely not ideal. It can technically be overcome because you can just kind of stipulate uh, that, in, as a matter of fact, our actual history is chosen from a set of histories which are strongly decoherent, meaning that uh, there are stable records of 
of the, of the past throughout uh, and, and also that they remain quasi-classical throughout. Um, but that seems somewhat ad hoc. You know, one, one can make that move, but really ideally we would prefer to have some kind of principled way of selecting the consistent set, which just uh, natu naturally leads to the consequence that the past is stable and that we get a sensible quasi-classical history throughout all time. Okay, so the third approach I suggest is investigating is a non-dynamical approach. Um, so that is to say, have, have our, our uh, one unique world supervening on variables which are not uh, which are not dynamical in some way. Uh, rather than being produced by time evolution, they have perhaps selected all at once in a single, uh, something like a, an overall global collapse. Um, again, this might seem somewhat counterintuitive because we, you know, we, we are, are very accustomed to thinking about physics in terms of time evolution features, but there are indications from other parts of physics that we should perhaps take non-dynamical approaches seriously. Uh, in particular, I personally would argue that uh, both special and general relativity make a lot more sense if you think about them in non-dynamical terms. Um, and so it, it seems to, reasonable to think that we should at least investigate whether non-dynamical approaches could perhaps help us with the measurement problem. Uh, so the consistent histories approach I just described is in fact also non-dynamical since the kind of whole history is selected and actualized at once. Um, but here I want to, want to talk about a different non-dynamical approach, uh, which is uh, Kent's Lorentzian solution to the quantum reality problem. So Kent's approach is based on a fairly simple idea. The thought is that we just allow the wave function to undergo its usual unitary evolution until the end of time, um, and then a measurement is performed on the final state, uh, and the actual course of history is determined in some way by that final measurement. Uh, so for example, in one of his models, uh, Kent imagines a final measurement of the distribution of photons across space, uh, and then the variables are given by a mass energy distribution over space-time, such that the value at a given point is equal to the expectation value of on the outcome of the final measurement outside of the future lifetime. <coughs> so um, I should emphasize that uh, the word measurement here is being used fairly loosely. We don't have to think about this literally. We don't have to imagine there's a, you know, an actual observer outside of space-time performing the final measurement. Uh, the, the, the use of the measurement formalism is just a mathematical construction which implements something like a global collapse that selects out a single history. Uh, so in, in, that sense, in that sense, what we have is indeed uh, a non-dynamical approach because although the, the, what the uh, wave function is said to undergo ordinary time evolution, the actual variables on which our reality is supposed to supervene are selected all at once in that final collapse, collapse process, uh, and there will not in general be a sensible dynamical description of that, of, of that distribution. So Atkins' model can essentially be regarded as kind of a, a fix-up of the consistent histories approach I just described. It solves some of the problems I just set out. Uh, because, first of all, what it does is it provides a, a, a straightforward and sort of reasonably well-motivated way of choosing one particular set of consistent history. It's just the set of consistent histories that happen to be recorded in a position basis in, uh, uh, in the final state. Um, and in addition, it also uh, provides a guarantee that indeed the past is going to be stable, because kind of a key point of Kent's approach is that uh, an event will occur and be recorded in the vehicles only if there are effective records of that event in the state at the end of time. So anything that actually occurs must have effective ongoing records, and so we can be assured that the past will indeed remain stable and records will in general be reliable. Um, moreover, it seems fairly reasonable to think that something of, of this kind might work in QFT. Um, Kent hasn't produced a formulation specific for QFT at this time, um, but it, seem, it seems like this should work fairly straightforwardly. Um, one concern you might have is that Kent's existing models uh, are based on final measurements involving uh, measurements of particles or photons. Um, and as previously noted, particles and photons uh, are not fundamental in QFT, uh, so you, one might think we're going to run into the same problems as something like the Um But actually, I don't think that is a problem here, because in Kent's model, reality doesn't supervene on the particle form of photons. It supervenes on the result of a measurement on them. And of course, the result of a measurement can be uh, well-defined and precise, uh, even if the photon and particle states are themselves not very well, not completely well-defined. Um, Furthermore, Kent only needs the particles to be even somewhat approximately well defined in a sort of asymptotic way towards the end of time. It's not a problem for him if there are regions of space time in which there are no particles or photons to be found, as long as there are enough of them at, at the end of time to, to, define, to, de to define that final measurement. So, uh, again, I reinforce that this hasn't yet been generalized to QFT, but it seems at least feasible that something like, like this could work in QFT. Um, also, alternatively, one could, in QFT, one could perhaps just move to a model that is a different kind of final measurement that is better suited to the right kind of QFT system. Um, 
so I just want to finish by talking a little bit more about Atkins model because I think this model and more generally this kind of this, this kind of top down approach potentially has some interesting consequences of how we should think about humanity. It, it gives perhaps a different perspective on what we should say about the ontology of humanity. Um, so what's particularly interesting about Kent's approach is that kind of by construction, uh, the, the, the beables will by and large end up being associated with macroscopic happenings rather than microscopic happenings. Uh, that's because in order for an event to get beables associated with it in Kent's model, uh, it has, an event has to have effective records in the stick at the end of time. Um, and in general, we know that macroscopic events will have effective records at the end of time because uh, interference will produce robust records of them in their environment. And it's reasonable to expect that at least one of those records will still be there in many thousands of years in the future at the end of time. Um, whereas microscopic events in general don't have those kinds of ongoing records. For example, in the two switch experiment, uh, there isn't going to be an ongoing record of which slit the particle went through. Uh, and thus, what Kent's model says about the two switch experiment is that that the particle doesn't go through either slit uh, because, because there will be no beables associated with, with there won't be beables associated with one particular part or another. Um, in different versions of Kent's model, one might either get kind of just a smearing of variables over both parts or just no variables at all. Uh, so Kent's, Kent's model gives us, gives us a picture in which the predictions of both quantum mechanics and QFT in some sense apply really directly to the macroscopic measuring instruments, which are the ones that get recorded in the final state. Uh, they, they aren't really describing anything going on uh, underneath. Um, what's going on underneath is just part of the sort of mathematical formalism that's used to, describe, to define the variables, and the variables are largely associated with macroscopic events. Um, so the, and, and indeed, the only times at which sort of underlying physics becomes important is when small scale effects are ma magnified to macroscopic scales in some way. Um, that might happen through various kinds of natural events, but the most familiar way in which that happens is just when we perform a measurement. What we are doing in, when we perform a measurement, physically speaking, is magnifying some, uh, some small-scale quantum events uh, up to the state of some macroscopic uh, object like a, like a measuring instrument or the brain of an observer. Uh, and so we are ensuring that uh, there are effective records in the end of time of something, something defined at a more microscopic scale. Um, so that gives, that gives Kent's model a sort of almost operationalist or instrumentalist flavor. Um, it brings to mind sort of Einstein's famous question, you believe the moon is not there when you are not looking at it, because uh, in this model it really does seem to be the case that, in some sense, you know, quantum field theoretical phenomena just aren't there unless you look at, look at them and bring them uh, into relevance. Um, of course, that's not entirely true because there are many natural processes in, in which they're important as well, uh, but the, the, the key thing is that those phenomena won't, won't be there unless there is some kind of macroscopic probing of them which makes them relevant to what, what, what we record in the final stage. So Kent's model, in some sense, does justice to the intuition that a lot, of, a lot of people have that, in some sense, when we do a quantum measurement, we're bringing things into being rather than probing things that were already there before. But it achieves that within uh, a fully, uh, you know, realist, realist model of a model in which there is an observer and an independent uh, real world in the way that we would naturally expect. Um, and the bringing into being it doesn't happen because observers are special or because you know the world is centered on perspectives or anything like that. It just happens because measurement happens to be a certain kind of physical process in which the microscopic processes are magnified to macroscopic ones. Um, this is interesting, uh, partly because it could potentially give some new insight into various interpretation problems of QFT. Um, now, obviously, everything here is quite speculative because, as I say, there is no existing formulation of this model for QFT, but perhaps these kinds of thoughts could provide motivation for someone to create one. Um, so one thought is that uh, one of the worries people have about QFT is that when you take the uh, normalization for transformation down to the continuum limit, uh, it seems as though you're going to get a bunch of infinities in your Lagrangians, um, including for uh, the Lagrangians of uh, physics that appears to occur in our actual world. Um, and that seems not ideal if you believe that there should be infinities in reality. Um, obviously, the, net, the usual way of solving that problem is just to impose a cutoff and say that for some reason, quantum field theory doesn't work below that cutoff. So don't ever actually get to the continuum limit. Um, but a model like Kent's, some kind of top-down approach, could potentially uh, offer a different way of resolving that issue. Uh, because in, in that kind of model, uh, microscopic happenings become physically significant only if some person or some physical process is able to probe them. Um, and it's, it is, I think, reasonable to suggest that nobody and no physical process will ever be able to probe all the way down to a continuum limit, even if there is no cutoff, because that would presumably require something like infinite energy. Um, so 
when that kind of picture, you can potentially say, well, there isn't a cutoff, but also we don't, the continuum limit doesn't represent anything physical, it's just a, an unphysical limit. Um, and it isn't all that surprising that when we take an unphysical limit, we should obtain from infinity. We don't have to worry about that. So that is, is not that there's anything wrong with the cutoff approach, but these, are, the, these kinds of pictures potentially offer a different way of thinking about that. Um, in addition, uh, there's, poss there's a possibility for this kind of top-down approach just to solve some of the nat naturalness issues that people have been worried about with infinity. Uh, so, you know, roughly speaking, naturalness issues arise uh, when we have something like uh, two terms in the bare Lagrangians, and we find that in order to reproduce the observed value of some parameter, we have to very carefully fine-tune fine the, the values of the, the uh, parameters in the underlying Lagrangian uh, so that they match in such a way as to cancel out and thus yield the observed value of the parameter. Um, and if you think the underlying bare Lagrangian is fundamental, and you also think that fundamental parameters should probably be selected um, in an independent or random way, uh, then, it, then it seems a bit strange and surprising that these variables end up being as close as they do. Um, but if you take a more top-down approach and you don't think, think the real Lagrangian is fundamental, instead perhaps you think the higher level Lagrangian is fundamental, uh, then, the, then the fact that these parameters match is no longer surprising at all, right? Because they're just calculated from whatever the value of the observed parameter is, uh, and, and therefore, by construction, they just have to match in such a way as to yield the correct value of the observed parameter. So that is potentially one way of, of um, getting around these natural, naturalness issues by taking a top-down approach. Um, and last, this is a noticeable phenomenon that uh, QFTs defined at large distances uh, sometimes look a bit simpler than this, the small distance, supposedly more fundamental ones. Um, that's because we, we sometimes find that uh, the small, small distance Lagrangians have a lot more terms. That, uh, the, term, the coefficients of those terms go to zero as we go back up to larger distances, uh, and so we end up with a, with a somewhat simpler looking Lagrangian at the large distances and a more complex one at the small distances. That looks somewhat surprising if you take the view that the fundamental things should be more simple and more complex things should arise out of them, uh, but you can potentially avoid that if you are willing to take a top-down approach and accept that actually the larger distance QFTs are in some sense more fundamental and they produce the smaller distance QFTs. So uh, that's more or less all I wanted to say. Um, just, just to, to uh, so much, I think taking into consideration all these issues actually gives me great, great renewed optimism that the measurement problem could one day you know, have a, a, a solution which more or less everybody would agree on. Um, that's because by the time you take into consideration quantum field theory and you take into consideration the kind of epistemic concerns I've been alluding to and potentially you take into consideration quantum gravity, the options are very significantly narrowed down and so it no longer looks like we have a problem of overdetermination, um, of underdetermination. Uh, indeed, we don't yet seem to have anything which is unambiguously satisfying for all of, among all of those requirements. So there's certainly good reason to hope, I think, that we could one day converge on something which is you know, clearly the right answer. Um, so with that, yeah, thank you for listening, and I'm happy to see if there are questions. Seems as though you're going to have to specify a well-defined basis in which the collapse occurs.
somewhat well defined in quantum field theory like particle position, you would seem to need to find some analog of particle position in, inside of quantum field theory, and that turns out to be hard to do, I think. Not an analog of particle position, um, because it's a field theory, right? Um, so so I, I, I was thinking of, say, um, Daniel Bedingham's um, 2011 Foundation for Physics paper. Yeah. There he gives a fairly sch general schema, and, um, and you've got the coalescence mechanism coupling to. What he says in the, in the concluding paragraphs is all you need is a Lorentz invariant current and that can couple to things in the, in, in the right way and um, it collapses to approximately definite values of that. So, mm -hmm. I mean, and that, that's nothing like a particle position. So, I, I don't think you need anything like a particle position. Uh, uh, Agree. You need something which is going to, in the appropriate exponent limit, be a look like a reasonably well-defined quasi-classical variable on which our experiences could supervene. So the question is about, can you find something inside of QFT that will make sense all the way down through all of the scales of QFT um, in order to be you know, completely microscopic, which will still give rise to a sensible quasi-classical variable in the right limit. I, I don't know it's, if that can be done. Not, well. So what, um, what people have proposed is that Mass density, yeah. and the, the, uh, the idea that you know, if you know where all the mass is in the room, you know what, where the stuff is, right? Yeah. Um, and it's sphered, so it's not it's not it's not clear, it clear to me that it makes, makes sense to talk about it as precisely defined all the way down. Right. right. And um, then in the relativistic concepts, that would be a smeared um, momentum energy density, which you know, your zero component is a mass density. Yeah. Is that Unless you're willing to go with some kind of fundamental nomic vagueness, you are going to need a precise statement of how this thing yeah, works. Yeah, so it's not nomic vagueness because you, you write you write down the 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 um, stochastic equations; they're precise, right? Uh, um, but what is what, what you're collapsing to is is, is not a precise value of uh, mass density, but well, I mean, I argue that in that in that picture, the Thank <laughs> you. 
uh, so the me my actual measurement isn't going to tell us something. The information as to which branch occurred is encoded in dizzying high end endpoint correlations across the field operators and the cross bars. Yes. So I'm trying to work, I mean, I, I, I don't know if it, it, it's mostly a kind of cosmological assumption, but the topology goes differently, so the term of records will be dead in true in our topology. But in, in, in a sort of standard boring decision, very much tied to your way of thinking, and I wonder if it's a, a consequence of your view radical about the civil war, which is uh, you don't want to give any role um, in, 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 uh, in producing a shared point of view or anything related to um, uh, the equivalence and uh, not to interference with the uh, That's Rely on the coherence to explain why we agree on things to be to losing track of the same world view. I think that decoherence is undoubtedly going to be very important in any account of how we end up agreeing on things and how to get this, this quasi classical world. So I certainly don't want to say it's unimportant. Uh, I don't think decoherence by itself is going to do enough because, as I say, unitary quantum mechanics doesn't doesn't give you any mechanism to connect up the perspectives in an individual observers. So Part of that, so decoherence isn't going to do that either. Um, but once you have something like like cross-perspective links, then certainly decoherence is a big part of the story of how the information spreads out and, and we very quickly end up converging on a largely shared shared body classical reality. So uh, yeah, and I don't want to minimize the importance of decoherence. I don't think decoherence on its own will do the thing. Let me show the question. Suppose we all here um, agree on a statement about nature, a factual statement about something about nature, in some way. Um, and suppose that uh, uh, somebody else later on is making a, a, a super precise measurement of this blah, 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 um, that implies that uh, there is interference between what we agreed upon and some, some of them. Would that for you count as a uh, conflict between the single world view and what we have agreed upon? No, I think it's perfectly possible to accommodate some variable on which not everybody agrees. You can have, for example, a witness frame type scenario right. or in which there's interference and not everybody agrees on various things. You know, what's important is that the, the, the variables and the information that you know, we have all used to arrive at and confirm quantum mechanics should all be kind of shared and accessible, largely accessible to everyone. There needs to be a sort of shared basis of information which we can use to, to do science and to construct scientific theories. That certainly leaves room for the possibility that there are in experiments we haven't yet performed, some variables in which we wouldn't all share the same information, as long as there's enough that we share. Okay, thanks. Uh, Chris? Yeah, so I had a question that's very similar to today, which is about the, the original epistemic motivation is any two observers can converge on the content of observable reality. And it wasn't clear to me that Kent's picture would give us a very satisfying account of that convergence, but David already asked that. So let me ask the other kind of question, which uh, I want I want to hear more about the conflict between this and unitary only uh, views uh, in the sense that you can imagine that within each branch, Alice and Bob would converge on a shared view of reality. And so as long as
long as they're sort of interacting and you see them as within one branch, then um, isn't that epistemic uh, demand satisfied? So clearly you don't think so, but I just want to hear more about why that is. Yeah, so I mean that's that epistemic demand to apply to all of the successes, and so that epistemic demand in the sense that I'm making it would not be satisfied if not all of the successes of Bob Ellis and Bob agree, which I would be the case in every year. Um, and you know, the reason I'm making that, that demand is because I think that having non-unique outcomes leads to a bunch of epistemic problems, and maybe those can be overcome and maybe they can't, but you know, there's an obvious reason to prefer this, the simple single world picture for, for those to be epistemic reasons. But then it seems like the it seems like there's something more than just the convergence claim that's driving it, right? It's the, the convergence within a branch isn't satisfying because you you have this further claim that the the, the other elements of the wave function have to be taken into account in a particular way. So that, that's helpful to see that there's more going on than just the claim you emphasize. Yeah, here. The, the claim was is an, is an attempt to, to precisify what is meant by that single world requirement. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is both that there are not Everettian branches and also that, also that we don't have observers all stuck within their own world and are able to interact. And mm -hmm. I was trying to give a way of unifying both of those problems within one framework. And in the Kemp picture, you still would have something like the branches at all times before the end of time, though, right? And then well, in Kemp's picture, of reality, you know, the reality that we all are conscious of and live in supervenes on the result of the measurement and not on the, the quantum wave function. So you can think of the quantum wave function stuff as just being a mathematical tool that is used to define the distribution of the actual variables, and the actual variables define a single real world that we all share. So I don't, I don't think it's a comparable problem in the end. Okay, but then that's sort of an epistemically inaccessible final. <laughs> well, the, 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 the final stage is used to define the distribution of variables across all of space time, mm -hmm. which define the actual history of the measurement. Okay. Um, similar, a little bit related. Um, so, I'm not don't particularly want to push back against the idea that there are not many worlds specific epistemic problems that we can clearly communicate, however they're successful. I think the single world epistemic situation is a little messier than perhaps you're describing it. I mean, I mean it would clearly be very nice if you had an interpretation of quantum mechanics where measurement is simply giving a packet information. But it does seem to be the case that none, none of the processes that we call quantum measurements on any of the realistic Maybe the measurement of position of the Bohr zone framework has that character, but other measurements of the Bohr zone don't have that character. Measurements of GW don't have that character. In, in general, measurements either in both GW or in Everettian quantum mechanics are instability generating processes which trigger something um, that leads to, um, to macroscopic superposition and then in, in GW or both to something else. Um, so I just want to worry a bit about that idea that the thing is epistemically unproblematic. Yeah, so I mean, when I'm talking about the single world, world being problematic, I mean largely in terms of the existence and access to macroscopic measurement outcomes. Um, and agreed, there's going to be a bunch of strange things happening underneath, and we might not have a very clear picture of, of what that is or any very clear access to what, what is happening underneath. But in most of the single world realist pictures, you have a guarantee that most of the time, one measurement outcome and it is intrinsically accessible to everyone, and so there's a sort of relatively uncontroversial body of evidence for quantum mechanics. Um, I think there's a little subtle in the looks, though. Again, I don't think it's really effective on the conclusion. I mean, if we make it's, it's true that <coughs> if I'm measuring some macroscopic quantity in the Borobo or GW, I'm simply passively reporting instantly yes. factor value. But well, that's true ever, too. But by the time I'm measuring something macroscopic, branching is going to have happened. Right. And now it's true that there are people causally separated. That's true anyway. I mean, you make a measurement in Azerbaijan, it's been announced. Right? Yeah. You know, it's, it, it's, um, the, the problems occur when, when I have something that triggers this. Right, right. Um, and, by the, and that happens prior mm -hmm. to the thing in macroscopically definite that I can measure. Right, but what I mean is that the, the measurement outcome is macroscopically definite and accessible to everybody, um, regardless of whatever you were measuring. And so okay, so, right, so you yeah. trigger the, the process, the fact that the process is called a measurement, yeah. it's misleading and so on. But nonetheless, at the end of the process, there's a yeah, so, so my concern is, is, is there a sort of intersubjectively shared body of evidence, measurement outcomes that we can all look at and arrive at quantum mechanics together? And in the single world realist account, accounts, yeah. agreed measurement is a bit strange, but we do have this sort of shared body of evidence, and in the non single world realist approaches, that less clear. Yeah, that's all. Cool. So, at the beginning of the session, you said that you were going to 
Cotton had dismissed Bodie and TFTs that took the old configuration as the I was a bit confused as to whether the reason was because we think those things are going to be effective field theory, so those can be the right candidates for tables, or if it was that if you interpret those as fundamental theories, there's something else pathological about either the EM field configuration as fundamental or like I guess the grass value field. Well, my That was specifically like something about those particular choices of people would have problems with your place. Yes, yeah. and, and it's unclear which variables would not have, have those problems, but maybe they, they exist in some way. I mean, I guess the thought would be a Boolean QFT that has some, you know, choose a QFT that has some like, well defined like, bio limit, and then imagine a version of both that says Beable is, you know, you've got superpositions of classical field configuration. Well, that's a hard problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it's and it's crazy to me. I mean, I mean, the thing is, you can you can do that. Sure, take a take a you know, do it you do it a hard task if you like. You can define in terms of person acting as the other left, but you just want to maybe you think they're going to bear the appropriate resemblance to the what maps up and get them to the the emergent level. I mean, that's the that's the ATS that you like. What we what we're seeing around here is the number of Yeah, sorry. I, I think I just have basic misunderstanding of what's going on in the Ken picture and why it's supposed to be a solution to what people normally call the assessment problem. And in particular, I don't get how what putting something that we're going to call a measurement at the end of the universe um, uh, could possibly be doing that makes contact with the kinds of things that people. Okay. 
nobody will ever be able to probe all the way down to the limit of the curve because that would presumably take something like infinite energy. Uh, and so that limit is just, just becomes a non-physical limit that can never be reached. And maybe we don't care if there are infinities in a non-physical limit that can never be reached. I guess part of my worry here is that um, Okay, okay, in that case, 